So did you learn about pelvic fractures? And what about extremity fractures? Did you learn about the classifications? Yes, no. So if I said, hey, what's the Burgess Young classification for pelvic fractures, you're going to tell me right off hand. Or if I ask you about the Gastello classifications of extremity fractures, you're going to be like, yep, I know what a 3A and a 3B is. Then okay, didn't think so. So um, those are important because uh, if you don't understand fracture patterns, you don't understand how to manage injury patterns and what's associated with them. So that's one of the key points of taking away from fractures themselves. I don't care about how you fix them, about we use lag screws or certain templates or whatever. I just need to know, you need to know fracture patterns so you know what to look for, for in terms of additional injuries and how to treat those in the early portion of their treatment. Um, so we're going to start with pelvic fractures and then we'll go into extremity fractures um, and some things that the score talks about but in reality is not going to be very important. So I'll try to kind of not cloudy the waters for you. Uh, these are low yield things on exams um, unless you get into more advanced uh, trauma critical care stuff where it becomes more important. Um, so from everything, everything that we do in terms of patient management in terms of any kind of fracture, is always going to fall ATLS. So any question on the exam is always going to be ATLS first, right? So you're going to do airway, breathing, circulation, all that stuff first. Uh, so just assume that's going to be that. I'm going to assume you know that. So now we're going to go into other things. So somebody comes in and they're in a high-speed motor vehicle crash. What are some physical exam findings that might be suggestive of pelvic fractures or significant pelvic fracture? What do you think? Go ahead and speak up. It's, I mean, I assume you know nothing, so it doesn't matter. So if you're wrong, you're wrong. Uh, maybe. Okay. So gross hematuria, possibly. Unstable. What do you mean by unstable? What does that mean? So do we rock? You can compress. Yeah. So you do know, is you compress. You don't rock anymore because you make things worse. So you look and see if there's any instability. What else? You're just looking at the patient. What what are some potential physical findings? or signs that you may see somebody you go, ooh, yeah, something bad. Out, Potentially, yeah. So a discrepancy of legs. What else? Where? Who said that? Okay, where? When you say bruising. Uh, That's important. Uh, maybe. More specific, though. Flank. <laughs> Flank, possibly. What else? Not so much in a female, but a male. But you can't be in a female. Yeah, scrotum. So, right, you have a big blue, purple eggplant scrotum. Really think about that. In females, they may just show up in the, in the labia area. So, you always got to look at the perineum. That's going to show you some stuff. Flank, yes, the console potentially. Um, and so, uh, you're doing your physical exam. What are some things that may be suggestive? Again, you, you talk about doing the pelvic shift. What else? Some things they talk about in textbooks that we really don't do any, like, it's, it's not very suggestive or is very sensitive for it. So you're doing a physical exam, something you guys do all the time that I laugh at you about? Blood on a rectal. Well, that, yes. What else? So, well, because you always, you're always trying to violate somebody. There you go, high riding prostate. Has anybody ever felt a high riding prostate? I've never felt one either. Uh, but again, I don't have ET fingers, so I can't really get up that high. So. <laughs> I've never felt what a high riding prostate is, but that is a classic kind of a question from an abscite standpoint. If you're doing a physical exam, high riding prostate, again, pelvic fracture, and again, associated uh, injuries. So you see this, you guys got, you has got, uh, you know, peritoneal uh, bruising. What are some associated injuries that you should be thinking of with pelvic fractures? So, okay, so more specific, that's a very specific thing, but globally. Genital urinary, right? So bladder, yes. What was that? Ureters. Ureters, yes. Genital urinary, right? So kidney or kidney, ureters, bladder, urethra. What else? So okay. So colonic injuries, okay. What else? Uh, potentially, but that's, uh, those arteries are very rarely injured. But yes, vascular. So any kind of the off branches of the internal. <coughs> What else? So it's a genital urinary vascular digestive. What else is in the call this? That we probably don't even think about. So if somebody had a type three 
sacral fracture. What, what would you expect to happen? Or they have a high incidence of or risk of having? Type 2 or type 3? Either one has high risk of having a particular problem. Neurologic. Okay, well specifically. So neurologically, yes, but what else? Okay, but what else can this person, male specifically, not be able to do anymore? Maintain an erection. Okay, you're already wondering, but no. Uh, well, not necessarily ejaculate, but. Yeah, exactly. Point. All right, you can probably shoot, but you can't point. So again, so those fake fractures you have to look at because they have a high incidence of having dysfunction. Um, so again, neurologic injuries, genital urinary injuries, vascular injuries, and digestive injuries. Um, so let's think here. What fracture of the pelvis are associated with exsanguination or high risk of bleeding? What does that mean though when you say open book? What kind of fracture pattern is that? But what is that? What's, what is that though? There's a, there's, there's a classification of those. So when you say open book, open book means different fracture patterns because it's not just one. There's, there's, so, there's several. So when I'm talking to you on the phone, you say it's an open book, I'll be like, well, what specifically? Because treatment's different. So what do we have? So, you, so you're doing this. What is that? What's that? You're doing this, and then yes. you're doing this. <laughs> so they can't do that. So, okay, AP. AP's one. Distraction. Distraction is what? I don't know. It's there. I know it. Uh, What's well, a component? It's not, it's not the actual fracture pattern, it's a component to it. So you have an AP. So lateral, lateral what? Compression, okay, so you LC. And they have shear, okay. So those are three main fracture patterns. Now you can have combinations, you can have a LC and an AP, but those are the three that you should know. And what those mean is, AP means opens, right? So you have a disruption of the anterior ring and the posterior ring. So AP1 usually just means the symptoms is kind of stretched a bit. So the posterior attachments are intact. So the ligaments of the posterior structure are intact. A little stretched, but they're intact. When you got into a twos and threes, those are disrupted. That's where you actually have an unstable fracture, because now you have two components that are, that are broken. Um, a lot of compression just means the vector force is coming from the side. So you'll have a, uh, let me see if I can pull a picture for you, but you'll see a posterior component of the sacrum or the ala that's going to be broken and it's going to be kind of laid out a little bit laterally. So ones and twos are okay when you get into threes. So APs and LCs have awesome, have um, three, three classifications. So ones are okay, twos and threes, think about it's going to be bleeding. So how do you treat that? So if you're, say it's an L, say it's in lateral compression three. And you see this, it's kind of sitting like this when you're looking at the x-ray. You're like, oh, this patient's hypotensive. I don't really see anything else in the chest or in the belly or anything like that. I think it's coming from the pelvis. How do you want to treat that? IR. Okay, let's say IR takes a half an hour. So do you want to put a binder on a lateral compression? So why would you not want to do that? Uh, we're not going to necessarily tear the vessels themselves, they're already kind of done. But what's the point of doing, what's the point of binding? Okay, but how does it do that? Does what? <coughs> but specifically though, so what's it doing? So if you think of the pelvis as a cone, right? It's cone shaped. So if it's open, what is that? Do you have any, any kind of formulas for a cone? So again, it's going to be proportional to its radius. So if you decrease the radius, all of a sudden you're going to exponentially decrease the volume. Oops. So again, the what-out compression is if you put the binder on wrong, what you're going to do is you're actually going to increase the volume of that pelvic, of that, of that cone. So it's going to make it uh, worse. Is here. All right, so again, Berger's young classifications. This is a lot of compression, if it'll let me do it. 
All right, so uh, it doesn't really show you very well, but you're going to see pubic ramen fractures. All right, so pubic ramen fractures themselves are going to be basically, it's still a stable fracture. So you don't have to really necessarily worry too much in terms of uh, what's going to happen, but again, the bladder sits right there and you have some blood vessels. So you can get, potentially get some, uh, you're not going to say exsanguinate from this, but you can get some bleeding that may be worrisome, but usually not a problem most of the time. Type 2 is where you start getting into problems. So again, now you're going to see fracture patterns posteriorly into the ally or even the sacrum. So now you're going to have essentially an unstable fracture. Um, and again, if you try to put a binder through here, what it's going to do is going to open things up. So if you're not putting it on correctly, you're going to make things worse. And then again, here's a 3, which is just a little bit more fractures. You can kind of get a nice little schematic here. We have disruption of the rings, you have an anterior fracture, and you have a posterior fracture. So this one actually is a combination, it looks like. And then again, you can kind of see the fractures back down through here. So when you see that fracture pattern, that's what you think of okay, a lot of compression. These are the ones that we always kind of talk about um, open book stuff. So again, Pubic symphysis diastasis, usually a couple centimeters, um, not inherently unstable. And then we go into type 2, in which you have over 2.5 centimeters. So again, widened right through here. And again, posterior disruption of the ligament. See, there's not really much of a fracture here, but the ligament structures are, in, are disrupted. That's when we start getting a problem. Again, you can kind of see the volume of the pelvis is now increased. And then again, if we go into a type 3, which is really bad. Okay, so again, schematic here. Again, diastasis, complete disruption of the posterior elements of the ring that's not completely dissociated. Pretty bad fracture. All right, does that make sense? Most people? Okay, you don't need to know the, the kind of the intricate details to it, just understand what these uh, fracture patterns are. And then again, vertical shear is pretty bad also, just basically a lot of disruption of uh, ligaments. You have elements that are kind of shifted up and down. You, a lot of times you see this with uh, motor vehicle, man, sorry, motorcycle crashes. Um, we have straddling injuries, and there's usually a lot of associated injuries with this also. So when you see these, they're bad also. And again, it's schematic, you can kind of see again, elements are kind of shifted. You have that kind of uh, vertical, um, vector forces. So again, AP injuries, especially twos and threes, close the pelvis. When you put the binder on, where do you put it? So when you wrap it with a sheet or anything that, that is going to close, what is it, where do you place your sheet or your binder? So what are your landmarks? And some of you should know this because we've talked about this before. That is incorrect. That is incorrect. No, like the top part. You don't care about. I don't care about the top part. You put it. You, if you use it as your landmark, you're gonna make things worse. That's too high. That's too high. Correct. So where are we putting it? Where's the medical students at? Where are we putting it? Where's your landmarks? So the greater trochanters. trochanters. Yes. That's what's gonna push your pelvis together. Put the wings. It's gonna make things flip out towards the bottom part. So again, the greater trochanters are gonna be your landmarks. So when we put your sheet on there. Or anything else, that's going to be that's where you're going to need to put that compression at. Middle, middle, that's just that, whatever you're. It you doesn't need that long. Though. That's the problem. All you need to do is get stuff around where the greater trunk is below the pelvis, okay. and you can actually do it without a sheet. You can actually internally rotate the hips and then tape the legs together, so it kind of closes things down too. But the, the sheet is just easier because they have associated injuries. If you have a femur fracture, you're not going to want to do that. If you have an ass tapping fracture, you're not going to want to do that. So. These are other injuries, but again, greater trip is what you're going to want to do. Um, so, what percentage of bleeding in the um, from a pelvic fracture is associated with arterial bleeding? So, what does that mean? Small. So, we said twenty percent. Twenty percent. Okay. A little bit high. So, what do you think? That's probably on the high end. So, it's probably around ten percent. So a vast majority of bleeding from the pelvis is going to be venous. So how do you want to take care of that?
So if somebody comes in with, again, the question, somebody comes in, has a LC2, um, hypotensive, you don't see any other injuries, all you see on the public x-ray is that, and you're like, I think it's coming from here. So how do you want to, how, what's the best way of stabilizing? How do you want to get that blood to, you know, to always minimize bleeding? What are some things that can be done? And you're thinking of going, well, I'm not going to put a sheet on because I don't, I don't want to make this worse, so what can I do? That, well, it's bleeding, right? So it's well, most likely going to be venous. You can try. You can say, okay, let's go to IR. It's going to take a you know, period of time to get there. And then you get in there, and they don't see anything. Okay, and they're, you know, they're still kind of marginal. You give them blood, and they're still hypotensive, and you're not really catching up. So what can you do? What are some things? And do what? Okay, so you don't have to go to the OR to do that, though. But, yeah. So what do you mean by pelvic packing? people that don't know what that is. Okay, so that's prepared to no packing. There's another one way. So if you talk to the guys in Denver, they love it. They came, they kind of the ones that kind of promoted that. So what but what else is there? This is where that multidisciplinary stuff comes into play. Exactly. So fracture reduction is probably the more important thing that happens. So that's where X fixes become really, really important. That he, depending on what institution you're at, you can do that straight there in the in the trauma bay. Um, pelvic fixators are pretty complicated, uh, so I, and that's not something I would do, but um, it's something that can be done in the trauma bay and get the fracture actually stabilized. Um, so again, help prepare to no packing or extra prepare to no packing, and uh, fracture stabilization are going to be the two main components to uh, venous bleeding. The vast majority of venous bleeding is going to stop on its own, but sometimes you get some pretty bad stuff where you have to go and actually do something. Uh, again, if you think it's arterial, then yeah, angio embolization is, is pretty good. Um, again, it depends on how much, how fast you can get your resources mobilized. Because you have, actually have somebody have arterial bleeding, still go in, pack the pelvis, and then afterwards go and do something if need be. So don't wait for IR. Somebody's having a problem, do something. Um, again, Second cross for kids, zone one, two, threes. Um, I'm not gonna really talk about acetabular fractures very much because those are more complex. Uh, and those are more, those aren't really necessarily life threatening. It's just more life modifying. So that's a whole different lecture. But to understand, there is like seven or eight classifications. So you have posterior walls, columns, anterior walls, columns, and things like that. So don't worry about that too much. Um, so we got that, we got that, we got that. Um, That, got that. So when are you going to want to do a, a retrograde urethrogram? Can you have blood if you need it? One of them, yep, absolutely. What else? Is that? I would. So every time you think that there's an issue, do it. Because the worst thing you do is put it fully in and it gets a false track and you disrupt somebody, especially a male, you know, it causes a lot of problems within the penis itself. So um, again, it, it, perineal bruising, scrotal bruising, eggplants, blood meatus, start thinking about urethral injuries. Uh, and don't be, as I said, it does very little to do a urethrogram. It's pretty, pretty straightforward and simple. Um, and you won't uh, cause any more problems. Um, dun -dun 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 -dun. Make sure we get kind of everything we want to do. So CT scan of the, um, what else? Okay. Yeah. In, in terms of cystograms, after you have a folian of a particular kind of material with a pelvic fracture, you probably want to get one. Yeah. yeah. For the other particular pelvic fractures, if you uh, get one regardless of the pelvic uh, Not necessarily. Um, physical exam, kind of clinical suspicion. Is really going to go off of because uh, it would say you know these certain fracture patterns are associated with it, and I'll be lying to you because I've seen all kinds of different fracture patterns that you're like I don't think there's a problem, and then all of a sudden there's a problem. Um, if you suspect it, then do it. That's pretty much the, the easiest thing to do. If you're thinking about it, just get it. This is not going to hurt. Uh, it's pretty pretty easy to get. Um, even the traditional cystograms, um, you shoot some dye in there, clamp it fully, it's fixed, and then great. If it's, if it's negative, you don't cost anything really. Uh, the thing is, if you miss something. 
that's, that's where the problem lies. But a lot of times with Foley in, you're not going to necessarily recognize it for a while. And a lot of times, that's the treatment of the Foley too. So, uh, but it, it, clinical suspicion, a lot of times you'll see kind of pubic granite fractures, especially, especially superior granite fractures. You start thinking because the bladder sits right there. Um, and if it's really displaced, you got to start thinking about it probably. Um, but I've seen even just minor displacement have an issue. So it's just, it's just suspicion. Probably a simple question, uh, but I've never done a system unit there. You just inject some gastrograph and have the meatus and the yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, okay. pretty much. Um, if you I mean if you have if you have a, if a C arm that's capable of doing uh, scintography, then you can just run it to a center run. Uh, but yeah, it's just the you know, catheter goes in kind of towards the tip of the penis, inflate the balloon, and inject. It's not comfortable uh, for the for the patient, but again, it's a lot less. Uh, cumbersome than actually having an injury, uh, but yeah, they're pretty. It's pretty quick. You can just do a quick X-ray as you're doing it, and as long as you see extravasation, you're good. And the same thing with the cystogram. You can just kind of fill it up, take a picture. Not a problem. Um, okay, what do we got? And, uh, all right, so we got a. Uh, let's see. How about a 37-year-old male was riding a motorcycle, gets in a crash. He's all kind of banged up. Comes in. GCS is 14. Blood pressure, systolic is 97. A heart rate's 115. What do you want to do? Walk me through how you're gonna do stuff. Does he have access? Yeah, he's got two good 16 gauge peripherals. He's, he's that's good. He's talking. He's talking to you, okay. but he's seeing you know, a GCS 14. He's a little confused. So how are we working this patient up? What are we doing? Primary okay, so primary. What does that mean? Medical students. What does primary survey mean? Okay. What does that mean though? We say ABCs. So what does airway mean? So the patent airway, that's open and so the air is moving in and out. What about breathing? What does that mean when we say breathing? So air is getting into the chest, right? So you know, you hear things equally, equal excursion. You don't have to worry about maybe potentially a pneumothorax or attention pneumothorax. Circulation, what does that mean? Uh, but question, maybe they can't get it right away. Pulse is where? Where am I concerned? Not really, it's usually central pulses, right? So if you have femoral, carotid, something that's central, because that's going to give you a better indicator of blood pressure. If you have one perfectly, great. But central is, because you're going to have a lot of things that are going on. Sometimes it's interfering, go, do I really feel it? Is it really there? I don't know. So go for the femoral, go for carotid. If it's there, you know you have good blood pressure. If it's not there, then you know something really bad's going on. Um, okay, so uh, 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 the disability, what are we doing? Yeah, just a quick kind of a little overall what's going on. Exposure, okay, great. All right, so we did our ABCs. What's next? I'm oh, sorry? Pass. What does that mean? Okay, pretty good. All right. So again, it's going to be really important somebody comes in and they're kind of clinically hypotensive. We want to find out where this is coming from. So fast, you're doing that. Okay, so the fast is negative. What's next? What's that? What x-ray are we getting? Chest and abdomen. Okay. Who, who agrees or who disagrees? So everybody agrees. I would do something different, but that's me. So chest, yes. What do you want to do on a chest? Why do you want to care about a chest? Rear fractures, I, I don't care. Okay, things that are going to kill you. What is, what's going to kill you in the chest? So attention to orthorax. What else? That's yes. If they made it. If they're yeah, that's it. If, they, if they've made it that far, they're probably going to live. But again, exsanguination, blood in the chest. So somebody's hypotensive, all of a sudden see this. One that's full of blood, something's going on there too. Also, so again, okay. So you said abdominal X-ray. I probably do something different. What did we just talk about? Pelvic. All right, he's got a pelvic X-ray. So if somebody's hypotensive, trying to figure out what wings on. That's where you get the other X-ray. So you get the pelvis, and then you see a pelvic fracture, and then that's where you go on your your way of okay. This is what I see. No, I don't see anything else. It's on pelvis. This is what we're going to do, and go on your management that way. Um, okay. So the big thing about pelvic fractures just is Find other things. Make sure that that's not the case of what's being, what's causing the patient to die. So don't assume you see a pelvic fracture. Go, oh, this is it. Other things could be going on. That's why you have the stepwise things of doing your evaluation so you don't miss things. But again, the primary stuff is just make sure you find something that's going to kill the patient now. Uh, your secondary survey is that's stuff that's going to kill them later. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions about pelvic fracture stuff? So again, understand the different classifications. There's three of those. 
the sacral ones is going to be oil yield. If you understand it, great. The higher the, uh, the, the levels, the more the increased uh, incidence of neurologic injury. Just understand that. So when you see it in the trauma band, go, ooh, this is a type 2 where it goes through the foramen. They get about a 50% you know, chance of having a neurologic dysfunction. If it's medial to that, which is a type 3, they have a semi-high risk of having neurologic dysfunction. That's pretty important. Um, but again, lateral compression, APs, the higher the level number, the worse off they are. So if someone ever says a 2 or 3, start going, okay, there's going to be bleeding, there's going to be other associated injuries, start thinking about that. Um, Again, management-wise, uh, for arterial, IR is really good, venous stuff. Again, fracture reduction is going to be really important, and then preperitoneal packing or extraperitoneal packing. I have a question. I was wondering about a scenario. If we had a patient who's hypotensive, and let's say there's a positive fast, and you also you have a, a pelvic x-ray, and it shows, say, a AP compression fracture, yep. and they're hypotensive, and you would need intervention. Obviously, it's a positive fast, hypotensive, you go into OR. If you also have that, would you ever like say, put a binder and then go, or just address it in the OR? Yes. Yeah. Answer, yes. What at that point is whatever you can do. Have you done it before with a binder? Yeah. Taking the operating room, you have work around it. Okay. And then you can still do you can still do extraperitoneal packing, right. even though you're in the abdomen. It makes it a little bit tougher, but you can still get into that plane and still pack things off. So that's probably the most prudent thing to do. You can put the, put the sheet on or the binder or whatever, get them up to the operating room. Once you're kind of in the abdomen, do your thing, and then you kind of release, go down towards the pelvis and start packing off, you can do that too. And then afterwards, you can go to IR if you think if you're suspecting an arterial injury. Um, but yeah, so if somebody comes in, that's, the, that's what we call multi cavitary injuries. So if somebody comes in, they have a pelvic and anterior abdominal, you just got to go and do what you, what you can. Uh, because. You know, you can't, you go, well, some of the things we talk about go, well, we go to IR, we can do this and do that. It doesn't come into play. So if somebody gets shot in the chest and goes in the abdomen, you got to do both. You got to get in the chest and the abdomen sometimes. Um, so, again, that's why multi-cavitary trauma is one of the tougher things to, to do. So whatever you can do, but the thing is, operating is probably going to be the safest place because you can do a lot more there than anywhere else. So that's my, my, that's what I would do. So, all right, any other questions on pelvic stuff? Since you guys all read everything, so it's great. You go ahead. When you have that, do you make the laparotomy incision? Yeah. Down so you can. Just don't get into the peritoneum. Okay. So if you stay kind of above the belly button, sometimes you have to get lower. That's where you have to kind of adjust, and you have to kind of be able to adjust what you're doing on the fly. Okay. But if you keep the peritoneum intact, then you can actually, it makes it a lot easier to pack. If you still get down low, you can still get around and pack it. It's just, you know, it's not as awesome, but it helps uh, until you can either potentially get the IR or just resuscitate and come back and do it again. So, uh, but again, if somebody's got, you know, an avulsion injury of the mesenteric artery and you got something in the pelvis, you got two things that are killing them, you got you to deal with both. So, um, you just, it's just something that you just go, go do. Okay, extremity fractures. Who knows about the Gastilla classification? Or who's heard of it? Gastilla Anderson. You should have, because it's some of the things we talk about. I know I've talked about with this with some of you, because we have. You see this all the time. All right, we had one yesterday. Who was in trauma yesterday? Yesterday morning. Who was there? Exactly. You were there. Okay. So why was that a big deal? So this patient came in and had open bilateral femur fractures. Why is that a big deal as opposed to closed femur fractures? Exactly. What else specific though? Risk of infection leads to what? Increased risk of what? Yeah. Amputation, limb loss. All right. So in the late 70s, some people named a person, a doctor named Stillen Anderson, came up with a, a night, uh, it's kind of a grading scale. They looked at a bunch of different fractures and said, what is the risk of having problems? And this was specifically for tibia fractures because they had a high incidence of limb loss. And they're like, okay, well, we got these things. You got this, this, and this. As the grade gets higher, the higher the increase of um, the risk of losing that limb. So it becomes important for us, since we're the first person to actually see the patient, um, to understand what that means because how you treat it is really important. And so, uh, let's see. So when you have somebody comes in with an open uh, fracture. What are, what, are, what are some key components that are important for us to know for our ortho colleagues? 
So what's important in terms of management of that specific injury? Is there a pulse distal? Yeah, so vascular, right? So if there's a vascular injury, that automatically goes up to a, what we call 3C, super high risk of, uh, of limb loss, right? This is for extremity fractures. Again, a lot of this was done with um, tibial fractures, and it's kind of been incorporated into a lot of other long bone fractures. All right, so again, arterial injury is going to be one of the important things. But say the in, in, arterial injury is fine. There's nothing there. Well, they're all, yes, but they're all, that's the way they're all jerky, right, because it's open. And assuming these are high energy transfer of, of uh, injury patterns, it's going to be dirty. But again, if there's something that has, like, you know, it's grass in it and there's, like, cow poop and something like that, yes, that makes sense. What else? Time. Somebody said time. Who said time? Okay, what do you mean by that? change the prognosis and management versus if it's been six hours and they are indeed pulseless. And it's so what is that six hour, what do you think that means? So where, do you, where does that come from? Uh, I guess time to revascularization, if you're going to be able to salvage that tissue, I think that's... Well, it's not as a revascularization, right? In terms of if... One, if it's going to be salvageable. Two, what you need to do urgently, how long it's been, how. So, how what's, what's the urgent, what's the, what is the most urgent factor yeah. in this yeah, open how, fracture? How quickly it gets to, to, it's the, for infectious reasons, washout, and antibiotics. So okay, so what part of that? Washout or antibiotics? Which one's the most important one? Because uh, this is where, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because some things that yes. are told to you are not necessarily right. That's the problem with all the attendees. I think they said that antibiotics. So time to antibiotics is the most important factor, right? So the time from the fracture it happened, the actual injury, to antibiotic administration. That's why I have to recognize anything that was like, you've got to give them antibiotics. That's the most important thing. So one of the things they tell you kind of in medical school is, uh, okay, so here's this part right here from up to date. Um, what they tell you is that, you know, you need six hours, you have that window to get them into actual getting in wound washout. That's not true, okay? So if you would talk, ask, ask a couple of the colleagues, that's, that's not necessarily the most important thing is the antibiotic administration. Now, debridement and washout is important. It's just that six-hour rule doesn't really apply to this. So you can go up to 12 hours and even 24 hours. Uh, but as soon as feasible is, is what they do. So a lot of times you have somebody come in at 11 p.m. with open fracture, and you call your ortho guy and like, hey, this is, you know, this is a 2 or a 3A. And they're like, okay, this antibiotics will do it in the morning. But you're like, well, it's 11, so it's six hour, five, you know, it, it, that's not the important part. So the antibiotic is the important part, okay? Um, let's see if I can find. The, uh, all right, I was trying to find the classifications for you. But again, so for the still classification, especially one and twos, they're talking about the size of the laceration, all right? So you're gonna have a, a number. Threes are important because there's a lot more tissue loss. And so the reason why this is important is because how you manage them. So one to twos, antibiotics are just going to be ANSEF. That's going to be not a problem. You can get them pretty much washed up, stabilized pretty, uh, right away. When you get to the threes, it shows us a lot more of a high energy um, injury. So you have to expand your antibiotic choices. Uh, that were really gram negative and some anaerobes. So a lot of times they'll say give them ANSEF and GENT with that. Um, or you need Clinda or anything else, you know, just different combinations. But it's also about tissue coverage. So a lot of times, especially for like a 3B uh, or even a C, you're going to need flaps. You need other, other transfer of tissue. Um, that's more later on the end of it. So just understand that threes are pretty significant when you, when you see that. So I would encourage you guys to kind of look at what uh, the Gastillo classifications are. The problem with Gastillo is that the inner user reliability is very low. So it's cool to talk about, but it, even amongst everybody else, you can't really agree on what is, what's a two, what's a three. Um, although a 3C is pretty easy because any vascular injury associated with open fracture is automatically a 3C. This means it's a high incidence of, of limb loss. Um, so antibiotics, washout, uh, fracture reduction. Uh, what are some things that we use to determine potentially if that limb is salvageable or not? It's been used a couple times here. People have mentioned it during one of our you know, M&Ms and things like that. But, what is that? So, you, what it, what, so mangle extremity score, just specifically, it's called the MESS score, right? Mangled extremity severity score. 
So what does that mean? What is that like? Why do we care? There's actually more scoring systems out there for extremities, but MESS seems to be the one that people reference the most. For the rate of amputation, yeah, but do you know consider an amputation immediately? The components to it. Do we know what it is? Muscle, arterial. Is it time? Uh, Age. So physiologic parameters. Um, let's see if I can find it. Uh, so yeah, so uh, the, but again, there's different scoring systems, and all that has to do with you know muscle, bone, vascular, neurologic. Um, some scoring systems have that involved. Uh, they have physical, physiologic parameters involved. The mess seems to be said used the most. Um, but is there an issue with mess? Is it good or is it bad? Is it okay? Probably okay. All right. So using that score, we end up chopping off a lot of limbs that don't necessarily need to be chopped off. And there's something called LEAP, L-E-A-P, had, that had kind of looked at using MESS, and they kind of noticed that there's an increased risk of amputation that can be potentially salvageable limbs. So if you have a high MESS score, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that that limb needs to come off. And that's where a lot of kind of experience and judgment comes in. So scoring systems are cool to talk about, but in re a, a practical application makes it tough. Because, you, because it's going to be kind of almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. You get kind of a score and go, yeah, it's got to come off. Is actually salvageable. One of the things we also talked about before, especially extremity fractures, low extremity fractures, um, if you have loss of sensation to the palmar surface, or the plantar surface, that they would cut the legs off. It does not know. It doesn't happen anymore based on the orthopedic data. Uh, so again, somebody has a neurologic injury, they don't feel the plantar surface, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to lose a limb. They're high risk, yes, but it doesn't mean that they all have to lose their limb. And again, that's what the LEAP investigators have found um, looking at using MESS and some other scoring systems. So um, it's cool to talk about, read about it, so you guys understand what it is. Uh, but it's not necessarily the most applicable uh, scoring system that we can use to recommend limb and salvage. Um, what else do we got? Uh, they also talk about, talk about like, degloving injuries, you know, really rotational forces on the extremity, um, depending on the tissue, what it looks like, whether that be salvaged or not. Uh, there's really nothing special about it. It's just you can have a lot of soft tissue injury especially muscle and uh, skin, fat, things like that. Um, it all depends what the tissue kind of looks like. And a lot of times the first look is not going to be your best look. Uh, that's when you need time for things to kind of happen and then come back and determine when that one needs to be group Uh We got five minutes. Okay, how about a uh, Morel level A? What is that? A Morel level A lesion. Okay, so soft tissue, off the fascia, what happens? Uh, not always. Maybe, depending on the size, but what else happens? That's more that, that people kind of more, ah, oh, I don't like this. So what happens in that, so when you have that shearing, what happens in that area? It's a, now it's a space, potential space. What does body like to do with spaces? Still fluid, right? So it's also called a traumatic seroma. So that could potentially be the issue. Uh, but it can be bleeding, because you've got the perforators, as you were saying, and you can have necrosis of the area overlying that. And you have skin that kind of, you know, days, weeks later, kind of pops off. Um, where does it mo mostly occur at? Hips. So hips, right? especially the greater trochanter kind of area. You can get it kind of on the buttocks, uh, seen on the abdominal wall. Um, but again, on CT scan, you're gonna see essentially an, a fluid collection or an area that's maybe potentially fluid collection. What's the management? Yeah, so the textbooks will say all of it should be debrided. So the reason why is that you drain the seroma, it just comes back. So the recurrence rates are high. Does that happen all the time? No. There's times you drain it, it does okay. Uh, some people are actually talk about using talcum in there to kind of help splurge things down. There's different management strategies to it. Textbooks will just say there's some sort of intervention to kind of clean that area out. But again, if it, if it becomes necrotic, yes, then you, then you have to deal with that. Um, Couple minutes. Any other questions about kind of the basic extremity fractures? So again, antibiotics is the most important thing. Wash out is the second most important thing. Fracture stabilization. Understand what the casilla classifications are, so you know what antibiotics to use and when to use them. Those are important. Um, and then take a look at the mess, um, because we have an idea of exactly what that, that they're talking about. Um, and then. I think that's really about it.
Okay. Any other questions generally on the stuff we talked about today? <coughs> Anything? We're all good? All right. So if I ask a question down on the trolley bay and you get the answer wrong, that's right. You're going to be forced to sit down and watch YouTube videos for all day, and it's all going to be David Hasselhoff. 